don't wait. Your tears are empty. Just like you. No! Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is a steampunk fantasy JRPG made by Square Enix and released on February 29th because 2024 was a leap year and Rebirth just had to be special, I guess. It's the second game in a trilogy that seeks to remake the original legendary Final Fantasy VII from PlayStation 1. It pushes the limits of what's possible at the time of its release in terms of visual fidelity while also doing its absolute best to learn from the games that came before it. Does Rebirth manage to take what came before and improve upon it, or is it just another pretty face with a nice coat of paint? Let's get into it. The thing I want to open this review on is something that I know is divisive, so it needs more attention. The minigames. Annoying though they may be to some, the sheer number and variety of minigames deserves mention, if not some degree of praise. Queen's Blood is an even deeper game within a game than Fort Condor was in Remake Intergrade, Fort Condor being the auto chess game which also makes its return in Rebirth. In the Gold Saucer alone, there is a boxing simulator, a combat racer based on the escape from Midgar at the end of Remake, two different battle arenas with one being in the saucer itself and the other being in the Dust Bowl beneath it, and a bona fide knockoff of Star Fox 64 of all things. There's even Chocobo Racing that is such a faithful recreation of Mario Kart that I can tell you which one they pulled from to make it. This is to say nothing of an equally huge variety of glorified quicktime events like the Junon Parade, which mirrors the same minigame used in the Honey Bee Inn from Remake, or every time you go to a Lifestream Spring or a Summon Temple. I mention all of these things for two specific reasons. One, to show just how much effort and dedication there was to creating a variety of minigames rather than having them become monotonous repetition, especially with the ones that go beyond and essentially become full secondary games like Queen's Blood or Chocobo Racing. And two, to point out the fact that if none of these things are your cup of tea, 80% of them are entirely optional content. Queen's Blood is a side quest that runs the entire length of your playthrough, but it's still an unnecessary side quest if you don't like it. You also don't need to seek out any of the temples to help with the additional summon materia if you don't want to, because you start with three summons to begin with, you don't need to go any of the life springs, and heck, if you really don't want to, you don't even have to unlock the chocobo to travel around each region if you don't want to. It's important to acknowledge that an extreme majority of this content isn't forced upon you, and then also appreciate the fact that all of that content is still there for those who want it. In terms of some of the more typical things, though, that I look at in this section, we have some negative things to comb through. The menu design is inefficient, redundant, and overcomplicated, for one. Typically in an RPG, you would access your party members, their equipment, and their abilities from pretty much the same dedicated party menu, but in this game, it's broken into three or more segments, depending on how you look at it. If you want to simply look at your party and see what they have equipped, that's in the party menu. But if you want to change their equipment, that's under equipment and materia. Therein, if the game then has you change party members, something which does happen fairly frequently and especially so in the late game, and then you would want to swap the materia equipped to one character to another character, there is no way to quick swap all of that materia loadout from one character to another. You have to swap each individual singular materia one by one from character to character, and the best you can do in that regard is hitting the touchpad of the DualSense controller to view all equipped materia on all characters at once and just keep swapping each one. Then if after all of that you decide you want to change the party members in your party manually, you can't do that from party or equipment. That is something you can only do in combat settings for some reason. The menu aside though, there are also some one-off problems that are significant enough to deserve mention. Roche and Vincent are both boss fights that can stun lock you to death if you get put into a bad position and they aggro hard enough, 
and Rebirth makes the same strange mistake that Spider-Man Remastered did, having you play an essentially pointless section in the past after you have already seen how all of those situations play out in the present. So instead of continuing the plot forward, the pacing comes to a screeching halt and you have to play something that ends in a foregone conclusion. All of those negatives don't, however, dismiss the positives. Side quests, speaking of pacing, are incredibly well managed this time around. Each major area of the game has a set number that you are always privy to, a localized bounty board that you can go to find most of them without having to run around and hunt down every single quest NPC individually, and all of them have some form of tangible impact on the experience outside of simply rewarding you for doing the quests. For some side quests, they will provide greater context to events surrounding the story of both this game and the previous one. Others, such as Queen's Blood, have their own long-form narratives that are independent from the main story. And almost every single side quest will have a direct impact on Cloud's relationship with a given party member. Improving the bonds between party members will alter both cutscenes and even some gameplay sections later down the line, and so not only are side quests better organized, but they have a reason to actually matter this time. And speaking of time, Rebirth also respects yours more, as one massive improvement to this game over its predecessor is the implementation of faster movement options for traversal to get around the world more efficiently, and fast travel, hallelujah! With the expanded world of Rebirth, something that we're going to get to very shortly, the devs really did have to do something to make getting from point A to point B more bearable, and fortunately for everyone, they absolutely did. Your ability to fast travel is generally restricted to named settlements and chocobo stops, and even then you're also further restricted to whatever region you're in, however, Depending on if you feel the need to do the side quests for it, you'll also have the ability to change regions via chocobo carriage for a bit, before then having the ability to fast travel between continents using a boat and so on. Eventually, by the end of the game, you're just given complete freedom to fast travel wherever you want so that you can clear up any side missions before wrapping up the story. Considering the previous game only ever gave you a fast travel option that you needed to unlock, pay guild to use would never actually pragmatically need after you unlocked it and then took it away in the same chapter that you unlocked it? Upgrades, people. Upgrades. What's most important to address with regards to the level or world is the purpose that this game serves. In terms of the new trilogy, this game serves to expand the world that Final Fantasy VII Remake introduced. Where in the last game we were almost entirely stuck in Midgar, this game expands the world not only to most of the eastern continent that Midgar calls home, but a good chunk of the western continent as well. In terms of major, non-spoiler locations, this game will cover Calm, the Grasslands region, the Junon region, Upper and Lower Junon proper, the Corel region including both North Corel and the Gold Saucer, the Gungaga region, and the Cosmo Canyon region. Almost the entire world of Final Fantasy VII is recreated in great detail to include a good chunk of the ocean which you also get to traverse with some exceptions of the northern continent in Wutai. The one specific negative in terms of level design that I feel the need to bring up is something that is actually more of a visual design issue, but I feel like it fits better here. Ironically, what I'm about to bring up is something that I've actually praised in previous games like Resident Evil 4 Remake, so I'll do my best to explain why it's a problem here and not there. The color yellow. In all of the remakes of the Resident Evil games post Resident Evil 7, at least as far as I know, they all use the color yellow as a guiding visual stimulus for the player, indicating things that can be interacted with, destroyed, or even just where you're meant to be looking. Many have openly had an issue with how this element has been used in those games, but I admittedly think that it has been used very well in most of those circumstances. That said, the point where we go from yellow being an intelligent visual design choice that guides the player through an environment to a patronizing, oh hey, the yellow paint fairy was here too, is with Rebirth. There will be sections throughout the game where the player will be expected to climb up some craggy cliffs, and in almost 100% of those circumstances, the cliffs you clamber onto will be painted yellow. 
This is despite the fact that, given the circumstance that you first find them in, the area that you are in is in the bottom of a ravine. A ravine on Mount Nebel, which Tifa, the single most knowledgeable guide on scaling the area around Mount Nebel, admits that not even she knows how to get to the reactor from the bottom of this ravine. Yet, obviously, someone must know, because someone painted all of the cliffs yellow to show you. In the villages and industrial complexes of Resident Evil 4, having the yellow hazard tape or old chipping yellow paint felt like it made enough sense in the setting that you could do enough mental gymnastics to justify it just fine. The yellow painted cliffs, however, especially given the scenarios that Rebirth puts them in, lose any sense of plausible deniability. Even with that being the case though, that's one very specific and ultimately fairly petty issue. Does it come off as patronizing and immersion breaking? Yes, absolutely, and it certainly will be for more than a few players. Does it ruin the experience? No, absolutely not. And in fact, let me now nitpick in the opposite direction, the city designs. Once you arrive in Junon and later in the Gold Saucer, you may notice a consistent level design element that acts as a theming device in each of these locations. In the Shinra cities of Junon, Midgar, and the Gold Saucer, there is a clear divide between the part that Shinra cares about and the people. In all three, there are sprawling slums and undercities with entire cultures of people who are both figuratively and very literally under Shinra. In these cities, the poor and despondent live in constant fear and uncertainty regarding their corporate overlords on high, never knowing when their rights will suddenly become privileges to be revoked. To cut away any of the flowery language and speak bluntly, these three locations all have an overcity, which is some sort of massive Shinra industrial complex, and an undercity, which physically resides beneath the plates and superstructures that support the overcity. In the undercity, you find all of the mostly honest yet impoverished working folk with big hearts dwelling in the very literal shadow of the mega corporate city on high above them. Subtle imagery this is not. Even then, in Nibelheim, you can make an argument that the village lives in the shadow of the Nibel reactor, the cause for Sephiroth's rampage, the annihilation of the original village, and then the subsequent full takeover of the land by Shinra. Meanwhile, in Calm, North Corel, and Gungaga, all locations that are no longer overtly under Shinra control, the cities are open and free. They may live in varying degrees of poverty, yes, but no matter what, there is a clear view of the sky, the sun is shining, and people go about their lives more or less as they please. That is, until Shinra inevitably invades. The level design of the cities and villages in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and how they correlate to the world that the game is trying to flesh out is the textbook definition of how to do theming through visual storytelling in level design. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth was pretty buggy on release, unfortunately. With regards to the game-breaking problems, the game did have one hard crash for me while I was trying to leap Cosmo Canyon for the first time, and one freeze during a very late-game cutscene that I'm not going to show here. In the middle of the road, we have some very weird mechanical issues that impact gameplay, like for example this time that Titan managed to interrupt Aerith in the middle of her Limit Break cutscene, something which conventionally makes you completely invincible, and then kills her before the effect of her limit had resolved? And then in terms of smaller things, we see a massive number of polishing issues, which in what is inevitably about to become an editing nightmare for me, I will sprint through for you here. <clears throat> Loads of texture and asset pop in during the opening Nibelheim segment, lighting errors in both the grasslands and later on the ground in Mithril Mines, getting the camera clipped through a chocobo cart in Calm while talking to Snaps, party members having pathfinding issues in cluttered spaces, Cloud's infantryman uniform and Zack's hair both clipping through the buster sword, Aerith's flower necklace really desperately trying to be anywhere but around her neck, significant texture errors in the haunted hotel, Aerith's Chrono Aegis ability not working properly if an enemy is moving too quickly, being bisected every single time that you do anything with a power cable, and finally, sometimes not being put in control of the only living member of your party when all other members die, potentially causing the last member of the party to die. 
unlike my review of the last game, I'm not even going to bother addressing the stuff that I called sloppy design decisions last time, because with the scale and nature of Rebirth as opposed to Intergrade, some things like having your party just teleport on screen is kind of acceptable and a very, very lesser evil. There are much more important things to direct your time and funding at. However, with that being said, it was still discouraging to see just how many problems there were with a PS5 exclusive game on PS5, especially with how clean the port of Remake Intergrade was on PC. Hey. Thanks for watching this far into the video. You're a dedicated bunch, and I appreciate it. Please, if you like this video, consider subscribing. Always remember... And as always, to wear spoilers from this point forward. Let's go ahead and cover the broad strokes of how this game's story adapts the originals first. Of course, this also means that we're going to be hitting those heavy endgame spoilers immediately and unceremoniously, but you've already been warned. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth tells the story from the arrival at Calm to just after the Temple of the Ancients, although with a few minor alterations. First, Yuffie is no longer an optional character that you can miss, she is now a fully-fledged member of the party. Yuffie also never betrays the party like she does in the original, seeing how the party never goes to Wutai. You still wake up Vincent from his slumber in the basement of Shimmer Manor, and he does play an important role in the story despite not being actively playable. Kate Sith does still betray the party, and Aerith still dies, but only technically, and we'll get to that. Up to speed? Cool. In terms of the specifics, this is going to be a weird narrative section, because ordinarily, I would give you the Cliff's Notes version of the story, and then go into specific themes, character arcs, and touch on the details of what alternate forms of storytelling they use, etc. In this case, however, I'm going to be spending the vast majority of the time just trying to explain what the crap happened. Rebirth had a lot of explaining to do from the outset thanks to decisions made to change Final Fantasy VII's broad narrative by introducing the whole alternate timelines thing. At the very, very end of the last game, Zack is revealed to be alive. However, if you played the Crisis Core remake, which released between Remake Integrate and Rebirth, this is immensely confusing because Zack is very, very much dead. The scenario that's playing out here and why that is, is actually deceptively simple. The Whispers from the last game and now returning in this one are effectively a plot device antagonist. They serve explicitly as the arbiters of fate, maintaining everyone's destiny that is meant to play out as the universe intends. Only those whose lives are going against fate can see these Whispers, and only those who are actively attempting to defy fate are attacked by the Whispers. At the end of the last game, when the group defeated the Whispers and Sephiroth, they successfully escaped Midgar, which they were not supposed to do, and created a branch in the timeline. There is now a timeline where they lose and die at the end of the last game in Midgar, with the exception of Aerith, kind of, and a timeline with the group that we are now currently following, which managed to defy Destiny and escape Midgar at the end of the last game. In other words, we have a modern Ocarina of Time scenario. In this alternate timeline where the group dies, Zack and Biggs live along with his version of Cloud and Aerith, the latter of whom are both in comas for most of the game, meaning that there is now a Zack dies timeline and a Zack survive timeline running parallel to one another. Also, along with this fact, there is a distinction with the two Aeriths, the white plot MacGuffin materia that she received from her mother. In the Zack Died timeline, the Materia has now lost all of its power, becoming nothing but a clear, hollow marble. In the Zack Survive timeline, however, the White Holy Materia is still alive and normal. These branching timelines then go a bit haywire towards the end of the final boss sequence and Aerith's death scene. Just after Cloud snaps out of his Sephiroth and PTSD-induced corruption, he and Aerith both plummet to their presumed sort of deaths. After a bit of gallivanting through a presumably spiritual forest, notice that I'm using the word presumably a lot, they both wake up. But they don't just wake up anywhere, they specifically inhabit the bodies of the Cloud and Aerith from the Zack Survive timeline, the two that were in the coma. They then leave the house and go on a date. Cloud shows that his personality, or what little he ever really had, is back and the corruption is gone. And then several things happen. Aerith and Cloud go to the church in Sector 5, and she gives him the still-functioning Holy Materia. Then, while this is happening, Zack fails to stop Sephiroth outside of the church. 
Then both Cloud and Zack are pushed into breaches in the timeline, where they then fall out of that reality just as Sephiroth approaches Aerith to presumably kill her. This shows that Sephiroth will always be hunting Aerith, regardless of where or when she is. This also now means that our Zack died Cloud is now one with the Zack survived Cloud, and the Zack survived Aerith just gave Unified Cloud her functioning version of the White Holy Materia to replace the empty one that we've had for most of the game in the Zack died timeline. I know for a fact at this point, I've lost 80% of the 30% of you that were even this far, but I haven't even gotten to the complicated part yet. Zack has a decision of whether to see Kojo and try to save Cloud, or to stop Biggs from blowing up the reactor. Technically speaking, he chooses both. This conflicted decision splits off another timeline from the Zack survived timeline. You can also tell that each cutscene with Zack is in a different timeline from the main one because of the graffiti with Stamp, the dog painted on the walls of Midgar's superstructure that's an integral part of the Rebellion and Remake. In the original Zack Dies timeline, where the main group is stuck and where the last game took place, Stamp is a beagle. In the Zack Survived timeline, Stamp is now a terrier. We see this in the subway tunnels. And in the Divergent timeline, where Zack chooses to talk to Biggs instead of saving Cloud, Stamp is a pug, as seen on Biggs's bag. Now getting back on track, when Unified Cloud returns in massive open quotes, the dialogue he then has with Tifa, Yuffie, and Barrett implies very, very heavily that this is not the world that he left at the start of this whole spiritual timeline journey that started with him and Aerith plummeting to their deaths. Keep up. Yuffie talks to Cloud about a fight that never happened and events that she's unclear on, despite the fact that she should have been able to physically see all of them play out. Tifa digs up a conversation that had already been resolved previously in the game, as though it is still an active recent issue, and Cloud tells Barrett in only very slightly uncertain terms that he is pretty sure he's been transported to another world before Barrett just brushes him off. Then, during Aerith's death scene, we see a potential future where Aerith lives and Cloud deflects the death blow by Sephiroth, and another that fully plays out where he does not deflect the blow and she dies in his arms like in the original. It's open to interpretation whether the static glitching in this scene is A, two alternate timelines diverging like I just mentioned, B, a product of Cloud's trauma and degradation as a soldier that then plays out in his mind because he can't cope with losing her, which turns him into an unreliable narrator. C, the timeline actually just straight correcting itself or potentially being forced back into place by Sephiroth because it's noted that all of the whispers in this area are no longer the Arbiters of Faith, but instead beholden to Sephiroth's will. Or D, any combination of all of the above. Unfortunately for how deep the story gets, how fleshed out every character is, and how the narrative expands on the world that the original along with Crisis Core created, the story is so intentionally convoluted that no one is allowed to win. No matter what option you pick, no matter what interpretation you choose, you are wrong because all of them are valid interpretations because none of them are explicitly confirmed and everything is implied. The ending of Rebirth and the whole Divergent Timelines plot is only going to be as good and well written as the third game in the trilogy can manage to tie all of them together in a cathartic and satisfying way where Rebirth only had to answer for why there's now an alive Zack and a dead party, now the third game will have to answer for anywhere between three and five entirely separate versions of the same story, at least. We'll revisit some narrative elements that get told through visual storytelling in the visual design segment, and there are two remaining things I want to talk about here as we wrap things up. One, Kate Sith's betrayal is foreshadowed very, very well, and he genuinely spends long enough with you in the game to potentially convince new players that he's on the up and up despite all of the foreshadowing. That said, all the foreshadowing of betrayal, coupled with the trust building that he does intentionally go through, goes a long way to show how much of a conflicted character he genuinely really is, and it makes his sacrifice play at the end feel like it matters. And two, 
something which is going to be the single most gut-wrenching spoiler for certain diehard members of the community. Please don't take it out on me, I'm just the messenger. The creators have spoken, and they have chosen a clear favorite in the Aerith vs. Tifa war. A fair reminder, before we get into this, the same people who were the writers and original artists of Final Fantasy VII for PS1 all the way back in 1997 are also now the directors and producers of the remakes currently. This is inarguably their vision for the game. You can go on dates with every member of the party when you make your return visit to the Gold Saucer, and you have a default or intimate outcome depending on how close you are with that character. Between Tifa and Aerith, Cloud chooses a very clear favorite. When you get to the Sky Wheel with Aerith, a moment forces them together where they almost kiss before sitting down and having thousand yard stares, processing what they almost just did and questioning whether they want to. She confesses that while she only once saw Cloud as essentially just Zack, she's moved on now. Cloud isn't Zack. That's okay. Because right now, there's no one that she would rather be with than Cloud. Aerith loves Cloud. And that's it. She holds his arm and has to convince him to just let her have this for the rest of the ride, then Cloud goes from stoic to just full arrow ace, as when they get off the ride, she thanks him for the experience, and Cloud's response is... You're welcome, but I didn't do anything. He is totally oblivious and non-reciprocating to her feelings. Meanwhile, if they wanted to keep it neutral, they would then make Cloud respond in the exact same ways and have roughly the same situation with Tifa. Get on the ride, start moving, spin the thing, get pushed together, awkward romance, confession moment, end scene. Except this time, not only is Cloud not just a sentient plank of wood, he actively extends his hand to Tifa, takes the initiative, and chooses of his own volition to kiss her, not the other way around. It's been over 25 years and the creators have spoken. Given the choice, Cloud will reciprocate Tifa's feelings and not Aerith's. Finally, we can all go home and either cry or celebrate, depending on who you are. First, let's quickly recap the basic mechanical design of the new trilogy of games. The original was a traditional turn-based JRPG with a bit of open world free roam in between. Remake took the basic gameplay template that was prototyped by Crisis Core and then blended that with a turn-based feel by creating Tactical Mode. The combat in the new trilogy is real-time hack and slash, but with Tactical Mode, you can slow down time and choose specific actions for each given character of your party during that slowed time. This affords the player both the spectacle and freedom of real-time combat without losing the ability to take your time and plan out your next move at your discretion. Naturally, if you almost exclusively prefer the turn-based feel, you can spend most of your time in tactical mode, save for the required fighting needed in between to build up your resources to use commands. Meanwhile, for those who prefer the much faster-paced feel of the real-time combat and don't want to be bogged down in menus, there is a hot menu system that you can access with L1 or left bumper, which will grant you the ability to fire off a command that you assign with a simple press of a face button. Now that we're all caught up, Rebirth starts out the gate with more mechanical depth and complexity than the previous game and never lets up. To start with, you begin with five playable characters, which is more than you end the previous game with. This number will increase up to seven total characters with the introductions of both Yuffie and Kate Sith. Then, in addition to starting with more characters, Rebirth also takes the liberty of making three fairly significant changes. First, they took one of my personal favorite materia, Deadly Dodge, and baked the ability to attack with the special animation out of your dodge directly into every single character. Second, they took another materia and built it into every single character, the Parry Materia. Those who are familiar with games like Sekiro or Lies of P will feel right at home with how this one was implemented. Using any character, if you hit R1 or right bumper, to guard with a handful of frames before an enemy hits you, you will parry the move. 
Not all moves are parryable, mind you, but for the vast majority of them that are, parrying makes you immune to the damage that you would have suffered and potentially makes the enemy flinch, giving you an opening to counterattack. And third, the game takes the experimental synergy mechanic from the intergrade story between Yuffie and Sonon and fully implements it here. Synergy skills function very similarly to hot menu commands, except on the opposite shoulder button. By holding your guard button, meaning R1 or right bumper, it will open another hot menu, but this time the commands are those that you have unlocked between the character that you're currently controlling and one of the other two members on your team. You unlock these throughout the game by essentially just going through this game's version of a skill tree, a book that every character has called a folio. These abilities call upon a member of your party to do something with your character that you're controlling, be it throwing them into the air or guarding together to mitigate damage. Using these skills successfully will build the ATB gauge, the resource needed to use ability commands, for all characters involved in that move. Meanwhile, by using regular ATB weapon abilities like in the previous game, say for example Cloud using his Braver or Thrust, you will give the character whose ability you just used one synergy charge. By consuming a set number of these synergy charges that you've accumulated by using your regular weapon abilities, you can have two different characters use a synergy ability. These are like miniature team-based limit breaks that happen between the two members of the team you choose. You unlock these as you upgrade your folio, just like you do with the skills. Synergy abilities are immensely useful, not only for dealing tons of damage in a pinch, but also for the benefits that certain ones will leave you with after the fact, such as having infinite MP for a limited time. Just be aware that unlike a true limit break, you will still be able to take damage while using them, so it's entirely possible for you to start a very flashy animation only for you to die halfway through. I say all of this as a combination of a guide and a bit of a disclaimer. On one hand, Rebirth can come off as dauntingly complicated even to those who are initiated with the previous game, and obviously much more so to those who are not. It has a much higher skill floor and a much stronger learning curve as a result. Although, to be fair, Rebirth also tries to mitigate the potential of becoming overwhelmed by providing the player with the Grasslands. A huge open area with low level enemies where you can essentially just roam around and experiment risk free outside of Calm until you figure out what works best for you. On the other hand, despite the much harsher learning curve that may turn some players away, the base foundation of Rebirth acts as a testament to everything that came before it. The original game's turn-based combat returns in the form of tactical mode. The real-time hack-and-slash combat of Crisis Core and most modern Final Fantasy games is also present. The synergy system that was prototyped in Intergrade is now fully fleshed out and integrated here. And even the more wacky buffs and effects from the slot machine DMW system from the Crisis Core reunion game find their home as after effects of your synergy abilities. And on top of all of that, Rebirth then takes the open world free roaming that was present in the original game, but lost in Remake and Remake Intergrade, and brings it back again, making Rebirth a more faithful Final Fantasy VII Remake in some ways than Final Fantasy VII Remake was. I'm going to spend almost the entirety of this section talking about the visual design because, I mean, holy crap, just look at it, man. But before I do, I do want to shout out a couple sound design points at least. Leap motifs are used consistently well throughout the game to set the tone of different scenes relative to the characters that are involved in said scenes, especially with the themes of Genova, Sephiroth, and Zack. For example, when Zack ends up getting cornered by Shinra soldiers while in Midgar, it looks like fate is going to play out exactly as it does in Crisis Core. No matter where he goes, Zack will always be gunned down by the Shinra military. When this happens, the leitmotif for Price of Freedom, Zack's theme that plays at his death, starts to play. However, recognizing that this is what fate has in store for him, Zack rejects his destiny, and instead of fighting the soldiers, which he knows will end in his death, he flees, which then brings the leitmotif to end in a positive major key, rather than the more somber and negative minor that it's supposed to resolve in. This is my life. I make the rules! Ah! See you never! And on an unrelated note, 
Can we just acknowledge how chunky the counter stand sound is? I'm waiting. Just for that reason alone, I regret not using it more. The Final Fantasy VII Remake games know they are pretty, and Rebirth continues to push the envelope that Remake Intergrade sealed. For God's sake, one of the first scenes has such a highly detailed model of Sephiroth that you can not only see every single pore in his skin, but you can even see the follicles of hair on his nose! I mean, it... That's wild. The level of detail for both the in-game and pre-rendered cutscene models of these characters is just absolutely insane. And I recognize that this is essentially the critical equivalent of just going, ooh, shiny, so I'm just, I'm gonna move on now. Rebirth is a game where, in terms of visual design, it loves its little visual details. Little pieces of visual storytelling that you might miss if you aren't paying attention, but act as a reward for those who are. For example, while you're scaling Mount Corel, Yuffie, Barret, and Tifa will go on ahead of you in that order. As you proceed up the mountain, you'll find arrows drawn on cliffs that point you in the right direction. You might assume that because he's from around here, Barret is the one leaving these guides for you. However, upon closer inspection, the arrow is actually a kunai, a very common weapon for ninjas to use in pop culture. This alone means that despite Barret's face next to the arrow, Yuffie's actually the one trying to be helpful in this scenario. As you find more of them, the kunai shape becomes more defined, and the faces will change. First, there's an angry Barret, then a happy Yuffie and a Barret, then a sad Yuffie and a much angrier Barret, then a scolding Yuffie and a sad Barret, and a distressed Yuffie as Barret begins to cry. And then there is a happy Barret once Tifa finally shows up to save the day with a laughing Yuffie. Meanwhile, if you ignore Yuffie's directions, which do admittedly show you the most efficient path of the mountain, you'll find encounters with new enemies and the occasional loot chest off the beaten path. The visuals are also more heavily leveraged to sell Cloud's speed and power in combat with how they've changed his Punisher mode. In both games, Punisher mode works the same way mechanically, but in the last game, Cloud would just perform a faster and more aggressive flurry of attacks. In Rebirth, Cloud doesn't just simply attack quickly and more aggressively, he literally attacks so quickly that he moves faster than the eye can see, causing him to disappear during his strikes, only appearing after he lands the blow and immediately dashes again. This could also be seen as a gameplay application of the level of power that we saw Cloud use against Sephiroth in the past, which is something that up until that point we had never seen before. In this way, the animation for Cloud's attacks actually demonstrate the fact that he has gotten stronger after the last game. Another little detail, albeit more of an interesting reference than a detail, is when you meet Dyne. His gun is likely a reference to the Patriot from Metal Gear Solid 3, a gun with two drum mags that are arranged like a Mobius strip, granting the gun infinite ammo. Unlimited ammo being a trait that both Dyne and Barrett's gun arms share. This reference is made almost airtight when you realize that this wasn't even Dyne's original design. This was. The gun was redesigned for Dyne's rebirth appearance, and seeing how the original designer is now the producer, this was almost certainly a very intentional choice to make. And speaking of Dyne, the more important visual design choices are the visual storytelling details that I said we would get back to at the end of the narrative section. Visual storytelling that specifically pertains to Barrett. In the review for Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade, I talked about how Barrett is visually meant to give you an impression that he is a hyper-masculine brick house with a penchant for violence, only to subvert those expectations as we slowly get exposed to the single most caring, human, and well-read person in the game, aside from Aerith. With that said, his personality subverting everything about his character design is a little disingenuous because, in truth, he is still hyper-masculine. And as a matter of fact, I think he embodies one of the single most quintessentially masculine traits, for both better and worse. <clears throat> Bottling up and suppressing all of our emotions, am I right, boys? <laughs> Barrett 
is an emotional character. He's a very passionate character. But sometimes, whether it's because he needs to be strong for the people around him, because he needs to get a job done, or just because he can't afford to process the emotions he's feeling right now for fear of showing weakness, he will suppress and retreat his emotions inside of himself. And every single time, this is visually shown to the player rather than stated. While Barrett actively wears his passion and his ambition on his non-existent sleeves, he wears his heart in his eyes. Let's go. Upon returning home, knowing the ridicule and abuse that would be dumped on him, after having to bear the weight of his delusional best friend dropping a lifetime of guilt on his shoulders with his dying breath, after completing Red 13's trial and learning of the fate of his family, heck, if you have Barrett on your team to fight in the arena against Corneo's goons after he goes to see Loveless in the theater, he will actually have his shades on because the play only reminded him that Jesse is gone. The eyes are the window to the soul, and Barrett, being the most soulful character in the story, knows that if he doesn't want you to know how he's feeling, he just needs to block the windows. So this script is already 6,000 words long, and I think I'm about to wrap this up. My opinion on the game has shifted a ton throughout my playthrough. I started out really, really not caring for it. On its face, this game really isn't meant for me, like specifically, personally me, for three reasons that I can kind of distill just with who I am as a person. I got super overwhelmed because of just how much more Rebirth throws at you from the start compared to Remake and the fact that I'm so analytical and want to be good at the game, not only because of just I want to be good at video games, but also because I want to be good at the game so I have an authoritative stance to share with you guys, it led to a lot of overthinking that was very hard to avoid. Directly connect to that and compound on that issue the fact that there are too many playable characters at the start of the game. So not only are there more combat mechanics and other things to learn, but now you also have to multiply all of those things times five compared to one when you started with the last game. And third, something that I've just come to learn about myself in recent years, I get very into roleplay when it comes to RPGs, and so in a narratively driven RPG setting, I'm always thinking about what would my character want to do in this given situation? What would they say? Who would they bring along? How would this impact his relationship with another character? And so on. Trying to do that in this setting with these characters, in addition to all the learning curve issues, just led to me frying my brain after around the first nine hours or so. Once I word barfed into my notes and basically journaled about why I hated playing Rebirth in the beginning, I finally managed to change where I was coming from psychologically, and I started to really enjoy Rebirth. That said, I definitely started to like the game a lot more as it went on, to the point where I'm honestly a bit torn on which game I like more now, Rebirth or Intergrade. I'm really not sure, because although I had a much more consistently positive experience with the last game, I think the highs of this game outweigh that even if it was an uphill battle to get to them. Rebirth made me care a lot more about these characters than the last game, and I got even more invested in Queen's Blood than I did in Fort Condor, which, man, that says a lot. I'll give Rebirth a 4 out of 5 opinion score. Lower end of 4, but a 4. Although something that I will stand by is the idea that this game starts rough. I understand that this is a perception thing, because even as I mentioned before, in retrospect, the game gives you a giant, easy free roam area for you to take time and learn in. But I never felt that way. That statement is an objective observation of what the game factually was designed to do which is completely ignorant of the fact that I never felt like I was free to learn at my own pace at all. Still, even though it was very intentionally done that way, it failed for me. But enough about what I think. Is the game actually good?
Thank you all so much for watching, and holy crap, this game was so much longer than I thought it was going to be. I literally played this game for 20 hours in a 27 hour window just to make sure I got this video done on time. So please, for my own sanity, if you like these kind of videos, please consider supporting the channel by becoming a member or a patron. And in the meantime, I have been LonelfyX, and I will see you, yes you, next time.